there are two final topics I want to discuss in this section of our course, and those are investment policy statements and the life cycle. As you might have noticed, chapter one of our text is a real grab bag of topics. I promise most of our other sections will not be as uh, all over the place as this one was. Uh, but I do think that IPSs and the life cycle are two things that you should absolutely know uh, within the first week of an intro to investments course. All right, so what is an IPS or an investment policy statement? Well, as the name implies, it's a statement about how some person or organization will invest their portfolio. IPSs are used in several contexts. Personal financial planners can draw up an IPS for a client. Uh, when we talk about IPSs of institutional investors like mutual funds, uh, those are typically referred to as prospectuses, but they can be seen in either realm, either you know in managed funds or for personal financial planning. Uh, the IPS or the prospectus tells a new investor in a mutual fund in particular exactly how the fund will manage any capital the investor contributes to the fund. Now, keep in mind that all IPSs are different, but most IPSs for managed funds have the parts I'm about to describe. The IPS starts off with an introduction. In the case of a personal financial plan, that might describe the family or the individual the planner is working for. Next, the IPS will have a statement of purpose, which describes why the IPS is being created. After that, an IPS will explain the responsibilities of the individual associated with the plan. If the IPS is for an individual or family, it'll typically describe the responsibilities of the client and the financial planner. If it's for an institutional investor like a mutual fund, it'll describe the responsibilities of the fund manager and the other individuals working for the fund. We'll also find some procedures describing how the IPS will be updated and how the fund will respond to various events. Then we'll always see the investment objectives. While some of the other components I've listed so far might not appear in every IPS, this one always will. Uh, the investment objectives describe what the client is hoping to achieve. In the case of an IPS for an individual or family, this might include being able to retire at age 65 and live on $60,000 a year until age 90. For a mutual fund, this objective might be something like maximizing capital appreciation while maintaining a moderate level of risk. There are also always going to be constraints on the client or the fund's behavior. In the case of the mutual fund, whose objective is capital appreciation with moderate risk, the constraints might also specify how much risk that fund is allowed to be exposed to. The amount of risk that is specified here, or the, the level of risk, is typically something more qualitative. You'll also often see a section that details how certain operations will be performed by the fund. These constraints might prevent the fund from investing in asset classes like uh, options or commodities. Uh, you might also see that the in this section, or maybe even in the investment constraints section, it'll specify that the fund is not allowed to invest more than 5% of its assets in any one security, for example. Uh, it, the fund might also be constrained from investing in certain markets, uh, etc. We'll also see an evaluation and review section that describes the fund's investment results. For a mutual fund, this section will detail, say, the annual return, uh, a variety of measures like the Sharpe ratio, and also it'll specify whether the fund beat its benchmark, which is just a, uh, an index or some other portfolio that the, the fund is being compared to. The last section is the appendix, and the appendix will often describe the rebalancing policy of the fund. The reason this is important is that some assets in the fund's portfolio will appreciate in value while others will depreciate in value. A lot of funds rebalance their portfolio quarterly or semi-annually to make sure they're holding the optimal weight of each asset. A fund might also specify the minimum and maximum percentages of the fund's assets that can be held in any one asset class in this section. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't discuss in a little more detail how a personal financial planner puts together an IPS for a client. The first step is to sit down with your prospective client and have a conversation with them. Your goal as a financial planner is to identify your client's assets 
and liabilities, their current income and spending habits, and then also how long they expect to be working and investing. A financial planner will need to identify all of this information and get the client to articulate any long-term financial goals they might have. A few minutes ago, I mentioned being able to retire well, but many financial planning clients also might want to send a couple of kids to college, or they might want to travel, or they might want to buy a winter home in Florida. As a personal financial planner, your job is to take those goals and then with the assets, liabilities, income, and spending habits of the client, you need to determine how to help your client achieve their objectives. You're always going to want to articulate how much risk the client's investments should be exposed to. If you have a client that has lofty goals and a long time horizon, they might have a high risk tolerance. If your client is near retirement and close to meeting their retirement objectives, they would likely be less risk tolerant or more risk averse. Specifying the level of risk tolerance for your client's portfolio like this helps you later when you need to justify why you're not recommending that the client invest in riskier assets that also have a higher expected return. As a financial planner, you'll also want to state how the various investments for the client's portfolio will be selected. Perhaps you provide some bounds on the percentage of the client's portfolio that can be invested in U.S. equity, bonds, cash, or derivatives. Finally, you'll want to identify who's responsible for selecting and monitoring the client's investments. This will depend on what kind of financial planner you are. If your financial planning firm is a full service firm and it handles finances, then that job might fall on you. If your client only wants advice, they'll be the ones responsible for buying and selling securities. Now, developing a well thought out investment plan like this encourages your client to follow a disciplined approach to managing money, and that will help them avoid many of the common investment mistakes. Having an IPS in hand for a personal client is a great way for you and the client to understand exactly how you're going to help that client meet their, their financial objectives over really a lifetime. The IPS can be updated through time to reflect changes in that, that client's goals or maybe changes in their life status, but generally you always want to have that IPS in hand. All right, let's try a practice CFA question based on what I just discussed. The section of the investment policy statement or the IPS that describes the client is A, the invest investment objectives, B, the introduction, or C, the statement of purpose. Well, hopefully immediately you look at B. B is the correct answer because it, it describes the client and outlines what's covered in the document. Uh, often the purpose and the scope of the IPS is included as part of the introduction. Uh, so B is absolutely the answer here. Let's try one more CFA question. Some CFA questions actually do something like this, where you're given two statements and you have to choose which of them is correct. So statement one or statement two or both. So analyst one here says a written IPS is part of the best practices for a portfolio manager. Analyst two says a written IPS ensures the client's risk and return objectives can be achieved. Well, absolutely analyst one is correct here. An IPS is part of that best practices for a portfolio manager. If you're managing a portfolio, you need to have an IPS. If you're dealing with a, a client, you need to have an IPS for their financial plan. Statement two, on the other hand, is a little tricky. I mean, an IPS, it doesn't guarantee that the client's risk and return objectives can be achieved. I mean, the goal of an IPS is to provide something of a roadmap for how they can be achieved, but not all risk and return objectives can be achieved. So the answer here is A, Analyst 1 is correct, but Analyst, two, analyst 2's statement is not correct. Now the final topic I want to mention in this extremely long section goes pretty well with personal financial planning, and that's the life cycle. Most people want to retire, or at least have enough money so that they can retire eventually. In personal financial planning, the life cycle 
refers to the fact that investors tend to follow different investment philosophies as they age. Younger investors like yourselves, if you're in my class, have a longer time until retirement. This means that you have more time to accumulate capital. Because you have a lot of time to accumulate capital, you can be a bit less risk averse, meaning that you can invest in a portfolio that favors growth oriented and speculative investments. Usually, younger investors will hold between 60% and 95% of their portfolio in equity, and the rest in other assets like cash and bonds. Older or middle aged investors might only have 20 years until they can retire. This means that they have less time to recover from a large decline in the value of their investments in the case of a financial crisis. This means that they probably should be a little more risk averse. They might only hold 50 to 80% of their portfolio in equity, maybe another 20 to 50% in bonds, and then some of their remaining portfolio in money market securities and cash. Finally, we have older investors or income oriented investors, and these are investors who are over the age of 60. These investors should certainly have a lower risk exposure than the other two types of investors. If there's a financial crisis and they're fully invested in equities, these investors might not be able to work long enough to recover what they've lost. Therefore, these investors should usually have between 30 and 50% of their portfolio in equities and somewhere between 50 and 70% in bonds, and some funds in other asset classes like money market securities. Uh, depending on who you talk to, those ranges will change. Now, there are a lot of rules of thumb you've probably heard that describe how a person should invest as they get older, like the 100 minus your age rule, or the one-third, one-third, one-third rule. However, every investor is different. They'll have different financial goals, different times to retirement, different income, and different expenses. Therefore, not every financial rule will apply to every investor. However, over time, investors should generally allocate a larger portion of their portfolio to assets that are less risky. Final CFA question. Emily Rose is willing to take risk when investing. She is young and has a secure, well-paying job, and her risk tolerance will most likely be characterized as, well, high, medium, or low. Well, in this case, she's young, so she should be investing in riskier assets like stocks as opposed to bonds or uh, some other security. Uh, so she, she would definitely not want to put most of her assets in or her portfolio in T-bills. Uh, in this case, her t risk tolerance would most likely be characterized as high. The reason is she she has a secure, well-paying job, so she has money coming in, and she's got a very long time horizon to retirement, so she can afford to be a little more risky and actually you know, accept the loss in the case of a financial crisis. So the answer here is A, she's extremely risk tolerant, or she should be. All right, so let's recap. I did mention IPSs and the life cycle in this uh, part of section one. And an IPS is just used to specify how an organization or individual should invest their assets, and it needs to reflect the, the objectives of the client. Personal IPSs are developed after a financial planner has a conversation with the client, and they've identified assets, liabilities, income, expenses, and objectives. And the life cycle is just a term that we use to describe how some individual should become more risk averse as they age. They should start to hold more of their portfolio in bonds as opposed to stocks and liquid money market securities uh, as opposed to stocks. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this section completely. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I will respond. So with that, have a good day.